Have you ever thought about how it is that we are able to engage in worship this morning in this place? <clears throat> you know, it just doesn't occur by happenstance. <clears throat> there are many things that go into making a suitable place to engage in worship. Certainly we have to have not that we have to have, but we, for convenience sake, do have a building. And I think we're all very appreciative of air conditioning, especially this time of the year. But there's quite a bit that goes in to making this all happen. Not only the physical plant that must be uh, provided for and taken care of, but there are legal requirements, too, in order to have a church, and there are financial requirements. And certainly there are spiritual requirements for being able to teach and preach. And the question is, does it all happen because just somebody shows up on a Sunday morning and unlocks the door, and poof, there it is? You know, somebody has to do that. And the question is, if you haven't noticed, some of us are getting a little long in the tooth. <laughs> Except Buddy, his teeth dropped out. <laughs> but there's going to come a time that those of us who have been engaged in, in all these activities are going to be gone from the scene. So who is going to do that afterwards? And I'll always say that I'm very appreciative of the teachers, especially those of the younger people. I would hate to have to teach the little ones. That is the most difficult thing to do. Presumably, you know, when we get this old, you know, we can reason together, come together. <laughs> it's not always the case for the young ones, but. But there's got to be someone that does this, and there's got to be someone that is preparing themselves to take over from those of us who someday, maybe sooner than others, will exit the scene. Well, does the Bible have anything to say about this, if it matters at all? Well, it, it does. And you're very familiar with the message that the Bible has in teaching these things, and it has to do with our talents, uh, more specifically the uh, parable of the talents. A uh, number of places in the Bible, but we'll focus on the account that occurs in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 14 through 30, and I'm going to read that, and I'll re make certain comments as I go through it, just to clarify what it's talking about, but that will not be the message. Verse 14, it reads, For the kingdom of heaven, and that's uh, the church. The church is the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a man, let's say Christ, traveling to a far country, heaven, who called his own servants, and these are bond servants, the Greek word there is, same as used for slave, called his own servants, bond servants, disciples, and delivered his goods uh, to them. He gave them an endowment of gifts, and he's expecting them to do something with it. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and another one, each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on to a journey, to say, the ascension to heaven. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded. He's faithfully employed in something that would uh, generate uh, a return on an investment. And he went and traded with them. Uh, them is those uh, who are doing business. <clears throat> and he made another five talents. And likewise, he received two, gained two more also. But he who received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. 
after a long time, the Lord of those servants came, and they say that's the second coming, and settled accounts with them. That's the judgment. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you have delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained uh, five more talents. He's made an improvement in the, in the gifts that were made to him. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. That's likened to a faithful Christian. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And that's the happiness one, enjoy, one enjoys in heaven. And he also, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then we came, come to the last fellow here. <clears throat> then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, gathering where you have uh, not scattered. Now, there's no rebuttal of this. The, the Lord, he didn't even address this, doesn't address it at all. <clears throat> maybe he was a hard man, maybe not, who knows. He says, I was afraid and went and hid your talent. Where the hiding, the fear and the hiding was sloth and an evil heart. <clears throat> See, hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But, the, but his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Uh, that's all unprofitable servant, uh, unfaithful Christians. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. He's making investments. That's what an investment does. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. That's the punishment of the wicked. And there we be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Of course, this is a parable. And, uh, you know, we have to ask the question, what is a parable? The para part of the BLE <laughs> The para is from the Greek uh, word, means to, to lay alongside, lay something aside the other. So you have, in a parable, you have uh, something that's very commonly known that's laid beside something that has a spiritual meaning. So it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Who told this parable? Well, it's Jesus. And why did he teach this parable? Well, it was to teach a lesson concerning spiritual matters. And it was very common for him to use uh, true-to-life stories so the people could understand and also he used illustrations familiar with their everyday surroundings. So this parable that we just read, uh, you know, we're very familiar with it. We've heard it many times. This parable teaches the necessity of work and faithful service in the Lord's church. Now the lessons of this parable, because it's the purpose of a parable is to teach a lesson, it focuses on three things. One, it focuses on the gifts uh, or the talents. Now a talent was something that people are very familiar with. It was originally not a coin, but it was a weight a measure of weight, usually gold, something like that, about 75 pounds, and you can imagine that's worth a whole lot of money. In the first few verses of the passage we just uh, quoted, we note that each man received something. No one went 
away empty-handed, though they didn't receive the same gift. And I think you can see that. We don't all receive the same gift. But each received a gift in keeping with his capacity to perform uh, the gift, perform the task at hand. Now, this is true of us in the Lord's church. Now, no person who is accountable to God is left out in the distribution of talents. We all have something. In fact, the people with the least talent receives a lot. You know, this one talent person, he received a lot because the one talent represented a very large sum of money. Small talents may seem of no importance to us, but to God they are very important. You, know, you remember the uh, cup of cold water in Matthew 10, chapter verse 42, giving only a cup of cold water. There'll be a reward for that. Or the jot and tittle of the law in Matthew 5th chapter verse 18. Every jot and tittle of the law would be fulfilled. Remember the widow's mite in Mark 12th chapter verse 42. Yeah, she gave a very, very small amount. Just be, wouldn't even be pocket change to us. But she gave all she had. And Simon carried the cross of Jesus in Matthew, the recorded in Matthew 27, chapter verse 32. These are just small things, but they were of great significance. You should never let yourself believe that you're a nobody or that you're not needed or that small matters don't count. They do. Today, of course, a talent, we don't use talent to be a measure of wealth. But we use that to indicate, well, ability, skill, ableness, capability, uh, capacity, gift, knack, things like, like that. God gives each of us enough talent to accomplish the work that he intends us to do. But we must supply the initiative. There is work to be done by every member, young or old, even though we may all, not all do the same work. 1 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And then in uh, verse 12 says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many, many are one body, so also is Christ. Now the 12th chapter of 1 uh, Corinthians goes on to say that we can't all be ears, we can't all be eyes, hands, or feet, that just means that we all have different works, but are of the same body. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 16 says, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, another good reference is uh, Romans, the twelfth, twelfth chapter, verse 4, which says, for as we have many members in the body, that's the church, but all the members do not have the same function, well, can we all be preachers, elders, deacons? Or can we all take care of the financial part of the physical grounds of the building? It takes many talents. We need to keep in mind that no two people are alike. Or if there are 10 kids in one family, Peace be upon you. <laughs> they are all unique. They all have different personalities, like and dislikes, different abilities. It would be, uh, be pretty boring if we were all alike. How would you all like to be like me? <laughs> you ask siblings, uh, they'll tell you how different they are. Our natural abilities differ. Some of us are athletic. Some are not coordinated at all. Some are very intelligent. 
and some are, are average intelligent, my friends. <laughs> some are musically inclined and have some other aesthetic ability. And some, uh, as we used to say, couldn't carry a tune in a tar bucket. <clears throat> Sometimes we can develop our gifts from the opportunities that we have. We don't naturally have every uh, ability. Sometimes we can, uh, as I say, develop our gifts. Our opportunities will vary from person to person. For instance, a child who grows up in the city doesn't have the same opportunities as that of a child growing up on a farm or vice versa. Or a child whose dad is in the military and has to move around a lot, even to foreign countries, as opposed to a child who grew up in one place. <clears throat> All these are nothing more than opportunities that we can put our talents to good use and develop them further. So as with the servants of the, in the parable, the Lord distributes our talents to every man according to our abilities and to the opportunities that arise. The master in the parable obviously didn't expect as much of the one-talent man as the two- and five-talent men. He knew their abilities. Now, the Lord is fair and, and will not expect more of us than we were able to do. But also, he won't accept less than we're able to do either. Our talents are given to us by the Lord, and we're only stewards of them. So the questions we have to ask ourselves are, how are we managing these talents that God has entrusted us, uh, and are we using them to the best of our abilities? The second lesson of this parable focuses on the, the use of the gifts or the, of the talents. The servants who received the two and five talents went right to work. And they probably had trials and temptations along the way. There's nothing to say here that it was uh, an easy task to double their fortunes. You know, sometimes when we read this parable, we think, well, just like that, they doubled their deal. But it may have taken a lot of hard work to do that. They were successful because of one reason, hard work. God in Christ set the example of work. John 5th chapter verse 17 says, My father has been working until now, and I've been working. Work involves several things. One, a willingness to work. You, know, you recall the worthy woman in Proverbs 31. She worked willingly, and she did not eat the bread of idleness. In Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, verse uh, 6, it said the people had a mind to work. <clears throat> they, had it, they had an idea that they uh, needed to do some work. And they, they were talking about, of course, the rebuilding of the uh, wall of Jerusalem. Even though at the time they faced uh, much opposition as a result. Second thing is diligence. Proverbs, the 10th chapter, verse 4 says, He who deals with a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Also, Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse 4 says, The soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing but the soul of the diligent, uh, but the soul of the diligent shall make, uh, be made rich. We're to be active, hardworking, and busy. Uh, busy. Uh, the word is, uh, of course, diligent. You know, put your shoulder to it. All work involves profit. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 28 says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Notice the uh, having something that is the result of working. It takes effort. And for those of you with a scientific bent, the formula for work in science is W equals E plus F. Work equals effort plus force. 
The one talent man represents the majority, unfortunately. In most congregations, there are uh, a few, two, and five talent men who work and shoulder their responsibility, but there are many one talent uh, men who bear their talents. Now, you've heard the saying before that uh, I'm sure for most congregations is uh, true that 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Do the scriptures indicate that the one talent man was a bad person, that is, morally bad, drunkard, thief, murdered, all that? Was he uh, merciful to people? Was he kind to the downtrodden, this, that, and the other? No indication that he was a bad person. He didn't even waste his uh, master's talent. He buried it. But this was a serious offense to the master. Why did he fail? Well, the reasons are the same for people in the church today who choose not to use their talents. One, he didn't have faith in himself. He was unsure of his abilities and was afraid he couldn't do as much as his uh, fellow servants. So he did nothing at all. Some in the church today say, I'm afraid I'll make a mistake, or I'm afraid uh, someone can do it better than I can, or I'm afraid I'll do more harm than good, or you, know, you can use your uh, whatever afraid you want to. <clears throat> when a person doesn't want to work, it is easy to make excuses. This is true concerning everything, as illustrated uh, by the story that you've been told here a time or two. When somebody wants to say, I want to borrow your axe, and you say, you can't borrow it because I need it to stir my soup. You say, well, you, you don't stir soup with an axe. So, well, if you, I want, don't want to lend it to you. One excuse is as good as another. So if you don't want to work, one excuse is as good as another. <clears throat> Instead of making excuses and being afraid, let's uh, remember Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some, well, if they can't have a leading part, they don't want any part at all. It's the attitude, if I can't be captain, I won't play at all. I believe this falls under the category of pride. We're not supposed to think we're better than anyone else. You might look at Philippians, the second chapter, verse 3. Also, the one talent man failed because he didn't have the courage to work. His master called him a slothful servant. In other words, lazy. He is afraid to work. The scriptures have so much to say on this uh, subject of laziness. So let's uh, just consider a few examples, certainly not exhaustive. <clears throat> Being slothful can lead to poverty. Poverty is not disgraceful in and of itself, but when it is comes with uh, from idleness, sloth, slothfulness, or extravagance, then it is. It is disgraceful. Second Thessalonians third chapter verse ten says, If any would not work, neither shall he eat. And it's not to say there's some that, you know, just can't provide for themselves. That's not the point at all. Some people think the world owes them a living. Well, <clears throat> Probably a shock to them, but the world is here first and owes them nothing. First Timothy, the fifth chapter, verse eight, says, "Even one who calls, even calls one who won't work, worse than an infidel." That's a that's an unbeliever or atheist. Another thing, uh, slothfulness is a waste and a misuse of energy and talent. Proverbs, the eighteenth chapter, verse nine, says. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great waster. If we could put all the time, talent, and energy that we wasted together, just think of what we could have accomplished for the Lord. Another thing about the one talent man is uh, laziness can cause what we have to deteriorate. Again, in Proverbs, the 24th chapter, verses 30 through 32. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding, and there it was, 
all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. And also Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, verse 18 says, Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. We must take care of what we have. What if we never painted the house or repaired the roof or mowed the lawn or never got a tune-up of the car or, or whatever it may be? As the old saying goes, it would go to pot. Slothfulness is actually theft. The lazy person refuses to carry his part of the load, so he lives off the labors of others. He is taking what he hasn't earned, just like the person who robs a bank. Look at the people on welfare today who depend on the government to feed and clothe their families. Most of them could work, but they don't want to, or they haven't prepared themselves to. The story is told of a king who called his economic advisors to prepare a paper on economics, which he planned to use to develop a strong and prosperous people. The advisor spent several months on the assignment and finally came back with 10 volumes on the subject. It was too long and too deep for the average citizen, so the king dismissed all the experts except for five, and charged them to make a report shorter and simpler. They came back with a 100-page volume on economics. The king demanded that the report be simpler and shorter. These economics experts worked and worked, and finally came back with two quotations from the Bible. If any would not work, neither should he eat, which we've already quoted, and then gather up the fragments, John 6:13. Some may think they're smart to get a free ride, but he is actually stealing from the benefits from some, someone else's hard work. <clears throat> I might add that uh, we've seen that here lately where you know, the government is uh, canceling out the debt of People are borrowed for tuition. <laughs> so me, you know, I'd borrowed for tuition too, but I repaid it all. Proverbs, the 12th chapter, verses 27 says, A slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. He liked to hunt, but he didn't want to prepare a roasted. That implied that he would starve unless someone else would uh, cook it for him. How do you feel about a friend that wants to, you that are students, or in work, they want to copy your homework or your report, or they want to take credit for what you've done? They may want a good grade, but they want to go out and have fun. They don't want to put the work into preparing the report or the homework, whatever it may be. <clears throat> Another reason why the one talent man failed was because he didn't have faith in his master. The servant accused his master of being hard and unreasonable. Maybe he was. <laughs> That's not an excuse for not doing good work. Some look upon God in the same way. They ask uh, questions like, uh, why do we have to go to church so much? Why do we have to give so much money and time? And why do we have to uh, deny ourselves so many pleasures? Why can't we say, do, dress, like we want to, and so on and so on. They view God as some taskmaster cracking his whip and never letting up. They have forgotten how much God loves us and what he gave up for us and should remember the tasks he gives us are not beyond our abilities to accomplish them. <clears throat> Another focus of the parable, and one we'll conclude with, uh, is consequences of using and not using. The parable tells what happened when the master returned from his journey. There was a day of reckoning, a day of accounting of what each servant had done with what he had been given. The five-talent man and the two-talent man each doubled their talents, and they were commended for their faithful service. <clears throat> 
And as, as I said before, there's nothing implied in, in this parable to suggest that it was easy for the five and two talent man, men to accomplish what they did. So now, even though one had ten talents, he, he doubled the four, and one had four talents, he doubled the two, they each had done what they could, and their recognition was exactly the same. They were called good. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22, uh, one of the fruit, fruits, I hate to use fruits plural, but one of the fruit of the Spirit is, is uh, goodness. In Acts 11, chapter, verse 24, Barnabas is called a good and faithful man. Joseph of Arimathea was called a good and just man. And Psalms 37, chapter, verse 23, talks about the steps of a good man ordered by the Lord. They were called faithful. First Corinthians, fourth chapter, verse 2, stewards are to be found faithful. Luke 16, verse 10, he who is faithful in least is faithful in much. First Timothy, second chapter, verse 2, faithful men are to teach others. Revelations 2, 10, be faithful to death. The Lord said, uh, well done. There is uh, nothing more pleasing to the ears than to receive praise for doing a, a good job. For these two servants, there was a twofold reward. They would be given more than they had. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you rule over many things. And in verse 29, towards the end of that, it says, For everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. Second thing that they received, they were to be admitted into the joys of their Lord. Now the one talent man was forbidden to enter in the joy of his Lord and was cast out in the outer darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He made excuses to his master, but you notice the master didn't accept any, any excuses, so it will be in the day of judgment. He did not relieve him of his responsibility for not using his talent. His one talent was taken from him and given to the servant with uh, ten talents. Was the master mean and harsh? No, it's just the inevitable consequence of doing nothing. It's a law of life that says we lose what we failed to use. If a person has special ability and uses that ability day after day, his ability increases. An athlete has to continually sharpen his skills to stay competitive. What happens if he fails to train for a long period of time? He loses his ability to compete. The same is true in the spiritual realm. Every gift given by God must be put to work or else it would be taken from us. What was really the difference between the two servants? Well, uh, two were profitable and one was uh, unprofitable. Why was that? <clears throat> was it because the two had more talent? Well, maybe they did have more business acumen than the one talent man. Was it because they were brilliant and had a knack for business? Maybe so. They were, their talents matched their abilities. They were commended simply because they had been faithful in the service of their, their absent Lord, and each had done his best. When it comes time for us to leave this life and hopefully go to our eternal home, some of us may have more trophies and more stars in our crowns than others. But the Lord will run out to meet us with the only words that count. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of your Lord. Now I want to close uh, by reading a poem. don't have a title for the poem, and I don't know who wrote it. But I thought the words were uh, appropriate for this lesson today. It says, in a napkin smooth and white, hidden from all mortal sight, my one talent lies tonight. Mine to hoard or mine to use, mine to keep or mine to lose. May I not do what I choose? Ah, uh, the gift is only lent with the giver's known intent. 
that it should be wisely spent. And I know that he will demand of every farthing from my hand when I in his presence stand. What will be my grief and shame when I hear my humble name and cannot repay his claim? One poor talent, nothing more. All the years that have gone o'er have not added to the store. Some will double what they hold, others will add to it tenfold and pay back the shining gold. Would that I had toiled with them, all my sloth I now condemn. Guilty fears my soul overwhelm. Lord, oh, teach me what to do. Make me faithful, make me true. And that sacred trust renew. Help me, ere too late it be, something yet to do for thee. Thou who hast done all for me. So I leave this message with you, and, and of course, uh, to be able to use talents, first of all, you have to be in service to the Lord. You have to be a Christian to be able to use your talents for the uh, Lord's service. Those who are engaged in what we would call good works, it does them no good if they have no faith, if they are not uh, one in Christ. So we want to allow the opportunity this afternoon for those of you who may not be in Christ to be able to confess him as uh, the uh, Son of God and put him on in baptism that you also may spend your talents wisely to the benefit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or if you have need to repent of some thing that separates you from Christ, we also allow time for that as we stand and sing. <laughs>